Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the 2022 Virgin Media Dublin International Film Festival. My name is Gornie Humphreys, and I'm so delighted to welcome you here to the First Frame Initiative. Uh, this is a film student initiative in which we bring film colleges from all over Ireland together. Um, we invite them to submit their films and we put together a showcase of new work. Uh, as part of this celebration of the work of emerging talent in Ireland, we also try and connect in with some established filmmakers from around the world and asking them to, to talk about how they got started, their influences, their process, and to give, I suppose, uh, advice, guidance, inspiration uh, to the filmmakers who are coming up uh, in Ireland. Um, and we'd like at the very start to acknowledge Warner Brothers, who are a big supporter and sponsor of this particular project. Um, I'd like to kick off by uh, inviting uh, some of the students who have joined us on this call uh, to maybe just say um, who they are and where they're from. Um, so if I could start off by uh, asking you, Greg, to uh, give us a bit of introduction. Um, hi guys, my name is Greg and I'm in my third year at IDT down in Dunleary. Fantastic. This is going to sound like University Challenge, I know, by the end. Um, Lauren? Hi, my name is Lauren and I'm in my fourth year in IEDT as well. Fantastic. Cahill? Yeah, so I'm Cahill. I'm in my fourth and final year in, from Dundalk Institute of Technology. Brilliant. Uh, Sophie? Hi, I'm Sophie. I'm in my final year in IDT as well. Brilliant. And Ingrid? Hi, I'm Ingrid. I'm originally from Brazil, but I just recently graduated in Griffith. Thanks, Ingrid. And finally, Blaze. Hi, I'm Blaze. I'm in fourth year in IDT as well. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. And thank you all for contributing, uh, uh, for coming along and joining us today. And the reason that we're all here, and I am so excited, I am a huge fan. I'm an unabashed fan of this woman and, and her work. Um, the wonderful, wonderful editor um, who has worked on, on such masterpieces, I'm going to call them out now, um, as if Beale Street could talk, um, Moonlight, of course, uh, the Underground Railroad, um, and Lemon, which was something that I got uh, a chance to watch uh, a week ago and just so enjoyed. And we're going to get into that in a minute. But please, please, a uh, huge thank you uh, to Joy McMillan for joining us. Thanks so much, Joy. Thank you for having me. This is so exciting. <laughs> I have to say, start kicking off I just wanted to say that you know during lockdown we've watched an awful lot of conversations and people have, have been so generous with their time but one of the finest conversations was the one that you had with a very good friend of mine Cara Holmes um which was just that's that's an absolute treat I have to say so um and, and one of the reasons why I was so delighted when you you, you said you'd be able to join us and um, like I said at the start Joy this is really about giving people a sense of a career path and, and how, how people got started. So I'd, be, I'd love if I could to take you back to that starting point, you know, and, and ask, were you always a, a film person? You know, were you someone who watched loads of movies as a kid or, or, or where did the actual kind of, you know, interest in, in cinema start? It's funny because I feel like, you know, I come from a family of six kids. And so um, a trip to the theater um, was, you know, far and few between. And so actually me and my sisters, uh, Jessica and Gian, we would pretend, um, we would call it pretend movies where we would set up chairs in our living room. <laughs> And then someone would be like the ticket person and someone would be like the popcorn vendor because um, we really loved going to the movies and we didn't get to go um, that often. So we kind of created our own little theater in our living room. Um, so I would say, yes, I, I did grow up um, loving movies. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory was one that was often in the VCR. Um, and it was one of those things that I initially thought I was going to go to school for journalism. Um, I was on the yearbook staff in high school, um, and it wasn't until my junior year of high school that my interest was piqued to actually get into film and film editing. Um, and it was, I was, you know, a part of this program called Junior Achievement. We met um, the first Friday of every month, and one of those things was a career day. 
And my first pick was to do the Orlando Sentinel because I had come from Orlando, Florida. And my second pick was film because my brother had just moved to um, LA to be an actor. And I was like, film seems cool. Um, and I got my second choice. And so we went to Universal Studios and they took us all around. Um, and one of the last places they took us to was this building. And um, I didn't know at the time, but it was like their post-production facility. And they walked us down the hall and there was a guy sitting, an editor sitting at, I didn't know at the time, but he was sitting at an Avid. Um, and he just showed us all these different things that he could do by just, you know, hitting a few buttons. And it really blew my mind because it kind of like revealed what was behind the curtain of filmmaking. Um, I don't think people know all of the, the different people, all of the different departments that go in um, to making a film. And that just basically piqued my interest. And I, you know, I went home and started looking up film schools and I ended up going to um, Florida State University. And did you study film there or did you, you know, where did the editing focus come? Um, it's funny because I, I applied to film school and I was so naive. I applied to film school and just assumed that I would get in, <laughs> you know, like I didn't, I didn't know how competitive film schools were. I didn't know film schools were ranked. And so when I went to my interview, I remember, um, there's a kid there. He's like, I've been to NYU, USC. He's like, where have you been? And I'm like, oh, this is my only choice. <laughs> like, this is the only one I, you know, I applied to. This is the only one um, I wanted to get into. And he was like, oh. And I was like, I didn't know that there was, you were supposed to have a backup school. Um, and one guy was like, how many scripts have you written? And I'm like, what? <laughs> Like, and I was like, oh my gosh, like this is a thing. Um, and my eyes are really opened at like, there's some people who grow up always wanting to go to film school and get into the film industry. Um, but it was fairly recent um, for me um, going into college, but I loved editing. And um, I ended up getting into the film school and they made us do everything. We had to direct, produce, we had to be a BBE. Um, script supervisor, which was one of the um, jobs I really fell in love with and realized how intricate of a part um, script supervising played in the post-production um, process. And, you know, tried all the different jobs, but really loved editing. And one of the things I thought was so fascinating is while we were at school, we got to actually cut on a flatbed, which is pretty much obsolete. <laughs> um, and I remember my uh, my other uh, my other um, fellow colleagues and students were so upset because we had like seven avids next door, and they're like, "Why are we on these flatbeds? They're so hard." And I'm like, "Guys, this is so cool! Like, <laughs> I'm like, just trust me. You're gonna tell people you worked on a flatbed, and they're gonna think it's really cool, and they're like, we don't care." Um, but I loved it, and working on a flatbed really taught me um, how important it is to know when to cut. Um, because, you know, when you're working with film and you only have one print, you cut that frame, you can't get it back. Like nowadays, you know, working on all of these different platforms where, you know, you can edit undo. Um, back then it was like, you know, you make that cut, you're trying to intercut a scene on a flatbed splices and all of that. Um, and the, it's very, it's a very precious way of learning how to make films, but it also kind of informs you on the importance of what an edit can do, it can make or break a film, so. And I'm gonna throw it on to uh, our, our, uh, our students here in a minute, but I wanted to ask you just a, a question. I was really intrigued about obviously the amount of work that you've done in television and in reality television. And, and I was curious about how that had influenced, you know, your, your skill set and your, and your process. Yes, it's funny. I was just thinking about the other day because currently um, we're working on the Lion King prequel and the basis of just about, well, the basis of all the scenes in the film, it starts off with a radio play and you're editing these voices. And it really brought me back to reality television where I was kind of known as the girl who could really do really good Frankenbites. Like people would put together a sentence and be like, can you make this work? And I would go through and, and through all their little interviews, 
put together these sentences that they didn't say, which is terrible. <laughs> I got really good at it, listening to the inflection of the voices, adding a little pause. So it made, it feels like a natural flow of a voice. And so I think that background definitely, definitely prepared me for what I'm doing right now. Um, because everything that you're doing when you're laying out a line or trying to find the right emotion, that radio play is basically the foundation of what they're going to use to then animate the faces. And so, the, you know, a pause in the right place or finding the right take where they go up on a word that kind of conveys this emotion of them being frightened or vulnerable, you're really paying attention with your ears. Um, and I think uh, that's one of the things as an editor, picture is important, but sound is very, very important. Um, and I can tell a lot of editors who also pay attention to sound, their presentation really works. The flow of the film is really engaging. Um, and that's them taking all of the elements to create, you know, the final piece. And I would say reality television definitely prepared me um, to do that. But also, it, you know, reality television, it's so fast paced. You know, I would at one time be working on five different episodes. And so it taught me how to prioritize my time. And it also taught me how to manage others because I was, you know, for a really long time, I was lead assist, lead assistant editor and I had like, you know, 10 to 12 other assistant editors underneath me and, you know, delegating work so we can get through the day um, at a very young age. I was only in my early 20s. <laughs> it's like, I I'm in charge. OK, um, but no, it really it really showed what I think a lot of people don't understand. I think people think they have to reach a certain age to be prepared for something but it has nothing to do with the age and it has everything to do with the experience. And I think, you know, as you move throughout this industry, pay attention to the lessons that are being, you know, not only shown to you or lessons that are happening around you, you know, <laughs> realizing what not to do, um, when not to insert yourself. You know, I was exposed to that really like, you know, really fast paced, you know, producers in the other room yelling at people because they didn't turn stuff in properly. And I'm just like, I never want that to be me. Um, and so I think I was thrown into it really early and it made me mature um, at a faster pace. That's that's fascinating. What a wonderful, <laughs> comprehensive answer. Um, Carl, I saw you nodding there. I know that you have a, have a couple of questions for Joy and I was just going to pass over the... the, uh, the uh, Mike to you. Uh, yeah, sure. No, um, just actually on that, on like kind of, you said you worked in reality television. I noticed when researching your work that Moonlight was your first feature, like your first feature edit. I know you'd worked on TV show before that, but how was the transition from kind of the TV format and the short format to a feature film? Yeah, you know, it's one of those things where I feel like when you are a true storyteller, um, you have the ability to tell a story in any type of format. Um, I feel like sometimes in the industry, they want to put you in a box and they say like, you do this, you know? Um, and I've always been a film lover. Film was always what I wanted to go get into. Um, but even to this day, it, you know, it's not dissimilar from high school. Uh, this industry is very clicky you know, and um, they look at your resume first and then you later as a person or as a filmmaker. And so like the credits on my resume just didn't have the prestige that meant you could get into film. Um, but it's hard because when you're starting out and you don't have very many contexts, television is usually where you cut your teeth. And so for me, I was always ready for the opportunity to work in film, but I realized that like, it was going to be very hard to get that first film to have that person say, yes, I trust you with editing my film. Because also the other thing that happens when you're in, a, you know, working on a studio film is there's more money in film. You know, a production costs way more, usually costs way more than a TV show. And so, and there's a lot more politics in film. Um, and so I interviewed a ton and didn't get the job. Um, and thankfully, you know, Barry gave me an opportunity and I always say to people, 
it's not it's not saying that you can do the job. It's being prepared for the opportunity because you never know when it's when it's going to come. And for me, I was like, man, whoever gives me that first shot, I'm going to totally prove myself. And it just happened to be Barry who was like, I think, yeah. Um, but and it's also hard, too, because you see other people get opportunities and you're just like, I could have done a better job than that. <laughs> <laughs> but I always say you can't pay attention to what other people's paths and where it's taking them because um, then you stop focusing on yourself. And so for me, it's the skill set and the determination that you have. You can apply it anywhere, I feel. Um, a lot of people are surprised that even though I do dramas, I also do dark comedy. And I'm like, I'm a funny person, I think. <laughs> like, I feel like I know what's funny and what's not funny. Um, and I think that's the thing that, like, I see nowadays, you know, with you guys coming up in this next generation is you guys are determined not to be put in a box. And I love that because I feel like if more filmmakers were doing unexpected things, it would just be a, a really, I feel like, a really more interesting films coming out. Um, no one wants to see the person do the same thing over and over again. It's boring, you know? Um, and that's one of the things I, you know, I love working with Barry is he just keeps on pushing the envelope. He keeps on trying new things and learning new things. And, um, you know, and it, for me, at the end of the day, everything that we're learning on these different projects is allowing us to become better filmmakers. And I think that's the goal. So. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, just like on that when working with Barry Jenkins, um, since with Moonlight, it was taking place over three different timelines of Chiron's life. At any point in the edits, was it going to be a bit more like non-linear, I suppose the correct words, like because it's very kind of seeing from like his childhood up to adulthood in a very linear fashion. Was there any chance, sorry, excuse me, was there any opportunity during edit to do something different? Or was that always the plan from the outset? Yeah, you know, it was we talked about it and the thing that Barry was being very mindful of is because, you know, the film is based off of a play and the first two acts of the play were written by um, Terrell and the last act is in the film is actually written by Barry. And so the first two, you know, you know, Barry was completely adapting and that third act is something that Barry, you know, came up with. And so, you know, weaving, weaving the three acts together would have done a disservice to what happened in between. You know, I think that's one of the things that is very cool about the film is we take you and just drop you into each of these acts, no explanation, um, no backstory, which some people love. Some people were like, what happened to Juan? Why wasn't there a funeral? You know, and it's just like, life is not, neat and tidy. And sometimes I feel like films give you too much and it doesn't feel authentic. Um, and that's what Barry spoke about. He, you know, growing up, he said, you know, people would be there one day and gone the next. And sometimes it wasn't really talked about. You'd find out later what happened to them, but that was life and how he grew up. And so he wanted the audience to experience that as well. Um, and I think that's kind of what, what staying in the three act structure is kind of, you felt that loss even more instead of, you know, making it a little bit more nonlinear. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, to kind of go back and kind of like your learning process of the editing, were there any editors that inspired you uh, that you would have learned of, of over the course of your career? Um, or was there kind of like kind of a natural kind of growth, I suppose? Uh, yeah, you know, I, there is, it's funny, oftentimes when I'm watching a film later, I'll be like, I want to find out who the editor was, because it was done really, really well. And I will say that Stephen Mirioni is an editor that, even before I knew what editing was, there was this film, Go, that, um, I don't know if it's as popular as the rest of his work, like Traffic and um, The Revenant, but Go was just, to me, I didn't know that film could feel like that, like playing with time and, and it was just, it was done really, really well. Um, and I remember when I you know started getting into editing, I looked up the editor and I paid attention to his career and the things that he's done is he's um, made editing like 
such another part of, you know, the experience, like traffic again, such, so well edited. Um, and it made me realize that everyone's not doing the exact same job as an editor. I think some people are very technical editors and then there's other editors that are like truly, truly, I feel like magic makers. Like <laughs> some of that stuff is like, oh my gosh, it's such an inventive cut. I don't think everyone would have thought of it that way. Um, and I think a lot of the editors who break rules, like I break rules all the time. People are like, can you do that? And I was like, I don't know, Barry liked it. So we're going to keep it. Um, but some of the choices that we make, like for instance, like in Lemon, um, Janixa loves to use the edits as, you know, as a, as a character. So oftentimes when we cut off one of the actors in mid sentence, it was so abrupt and people, it was so abrupt and the audience would laugh. Like they can't believe that we made that choice. And that was one of the things that to me is like, that's the power of editing. It doesn't have to be traditional. Um, and you are definitely allowed to break the rules if it's in service to the film and helping you tell a better story. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I'm conscious of time for the others. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to ask, end on this question. As an mm -hmm. aspiring editor, what, in your opinion, separates the amateurs from the pro professionals who make quality film and television edits? Oh, left the big one for last. <laughs> <laughs> Always got it. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, interesting because it's a really good question um I would say the thing that and it, you can apply this to any position um in filmmaking I feel like is filmmaking is a collaborative effort and I feel like people who really truly understand the craft of editing directing producing um they understand the necessity of collaborations because it's a film is not made by one person. And if you try to make it only with your voice being the one that shines through, it, 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 it tends to be a little hollow. I think some of the best films I've seen from a lot of directors is the stuff that they do very early on um, because they're unsure of themselves, they're vulnerable and they're really, really hungry to make an impression. Um, and I feel like, you know, the more money you get and the more people are like, oh my gosh, you're this person. Um, sometimes people tend to become a little complacent or like, you know, I'm so-and-so, so everyone's going to like it. And the quality of filmmaking is not the same. So for me, that's a separation of saying I'm, you know, people say you're only as good as your last film. So never lose that drive and never use that hunger and always know that there's something more for you to learn. You don't know it all. You're not the smartest person in the room. And oftentimes a good idea from someone else, you're like, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. And we can also add this. But if as a director, you shut them down and be like, you can't, no, we're not going to do that. Wasn't my idea. You know, that now someone will have an even better idea with that and won't share it with you because you now have, you know, made it see, like shown that you don't want to collaborate. You want to be the smartest person in the room. And across the board, people are going to be like, this is not going to be a very fun experience. Like we were just joking with each other the other day, me, Barry and Mark. And we're like, can't believe we're in charge. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Cause at the end of the day, we still feel like filmmakers who just like to make film. And I hope that never goes away. Yeah, Brilliant. definitely. Uh, if I just may just finish up one thing, I'm sorry. I just want to say you were saying about worrying about missed opportunities. I think considering the fact that you were the first black woman uh, to be nominated for Best Editor, you got an amazing opportunity with Moonlight, and I'm really looking forward to what work you have coming up. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Great questions, by the way. Brilliant. Thanks, Carl. Um, Blaze, I'm conscious that you had some some really interesting questions that you you sent in to us. So do you want to pass the mic over to you now? Yeah, of course. So I'll just bring up my list here. Uh, how many am I allowed to ask? <laughs> I'll, I'll give you three and then I'm going to go to uh, awesome. Sophie and then uh, Ingrid, Greg and Lauren. OK, that's mm -hmm. the order. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for spending this time with us. And uh, yeah, so the first question I'd have uh, is that, well, you have a 
you've said in a previous interview that you're not just supposed to notice our editing. I think this is a wonderfully kind of subtle and invisible approach towards editing, and it's very evident in your works. Um, but I was wondering if there's anything that you feel is unique to you as an editor and your editing. Oh, <laughs> um, that's another good question. You know, it's interesting. Um, I had a friend reach out to me. A film that I worked on, American Woman, was um, playing on HBO. And he reached out to me and was like, you know, I watched the film. And after watching the film, I was like, I want to know who the editor was. And it was you. And I was like, it, it made me feel really good because I've done that before to, on other films, like watching it and being like, wow, like who cut this is done really well. And I so I think based off of that, I would say that I have a musical background and I'm always like, I would say that when I'm watching something, there's like a, a rhythm a flow that I'm paying attention to. And it's just, sometimes it's off by a frame and I'll just, I'll play it back. And it's like, it's not clicking. And then once it clicks, I'm like, oh yeah, that's exactly what it's supposed to be. And I think it's because of my musical background that I kind of like, the way I edit is like kind of conducting a symphony, you know, like I'm paying attention to the movement of an arm and how it goes into the next shot. And then also like there may be a sound of a door that I'm, you know, connecting across the cut. And so all of that I'm paying attention to. So I think it's just the flow of films is kind of like my signature. Like sometimes I'll watch, like someone will be like, there's a section of like someone saw Zola and they're like, Hannah Montana. Like, I can't like, there's cuts in there, but I didn't know where they were. And I was like, oh, it makes me feel great. But it was like, I remember working on that section and it was like going back and forth between like, does this shot go here? And, and should that song, you know, that beat of the song, you know, hit that note. And it's like all of this, like in my head, kind of like scientific, um, but also like musical um, elements to it. And so I think it's like the beat rhythm and flow of my edit is something that's very unique um, to myself. I hope awesome. that Thank you. Make sense. <laughs> no, it's great. I was about to, one of the previous questions was, um, I was, was wondering if you listened to music while you edit, but that that answers it quite well. I think thinking musically is is wonderful and it's quite a nice Instinian kind of idea as well. Yeah, because uh, one of the things I do is I oftentimes when I work on something, I know a song's gonna go there, but I make sure it works without music. And oftentimes when Nick, our composer, adds a cue to it, it's just like the rhythm and the melody fits perfectly because it was kind of processed early. And so once it comes together, it's like, oh, that totally works. But it wasn't, it wasn't done simultaneously. But when it does come together, it's like, oh, the harmony has always been there. It's just the combination of the two now that totally works. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, next up is um, in an interview with Avid now, you said that you pick out an anchor take and you edit around that. I was wondering what the criteria is for such an anchor take. You know, I, I know some people may think it's cheesy, but I call it movie magic. And there are often, like in the Underground Railroad, I, um, when I'm working, you know, Barry and James were still shooting. So I was just watching dailies on my own. And I can tell when the actor, the camera move, the lighting has all just come together. Um, and there may be like one or two, like a bump in the camera, or an actor may have to restart their lines. But for the most part, it's the best performance. It's the best camera angle. Everything is clicking in that moment. Um, and you feel it. Like I've been on set. It's so funny. People talk about that one shot in If Beale Street Could Talk with the red umbrella. And they're like, this is such a perfect shot. And I was like, that shot happened because it rained. It wasn't supposed to rain, you know? And, but then it did rain. Um, and then there was an umbrella that Barry gave them. And then a scene that was supposed to be completely different now because of the rain and the intimacy of trying to fit under the same umbrella, that scene took on a life of its own. And that to me is the part that I really, really love about filmmaking is 
you know, the unexpected circumstances actually heightens the experience. Um, and it, it's it's elements like that where you know people will tell you like we weren't even supposed to shoot in this location or this actor wasn't supposed to be and it was replaced all of that stuff coming together you're like oh but it was meant to be so happy accidents yes exactly <laughs> that's actually happened in edits too i'm like oh that was actually not supposed to be there and there's like well i like it i'm like oh okay well <laughs> let's keep going so Thank you. And just my final question now would be um, uh, in an interview now with Slate.com, uh, you said that you always love when Jenkins says, put it back, Joy, you are right. Um, I was wondering, what's your trick to win over directors' opinions of a cut? Because I know as an editor, it's quite hard to kind of push a director towards a certain cut, you know? Yes, I think the best thing to do is know your audience and know when it's time to share an idea. Um, sometimes I'll share an idea too early because also as an editor, um, especially if your director is in production and you're kind of on your own and you've spent time with the footage. And then when they come back from production, they're just being, you know, they're also processing the trauma that is production and then preparing themselves for post-production. Um, and so, you've kind of lived with the footage a little bit longer. And so if you give them all of your ideas up front, you're, it's kind of being taken as like, this is what you did wrong, but this is how we fix it. That's not how you're presenting it, but sometimes that's how they're taking it. So when you know, and you can kind of read that it's time to make suggestions, that's what I'll do. I think I'll wait and then um, they may say like, oh, this isn't working. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I, had an idea it just so happens to be already cut can I show it to you <laughs> and um you know and that I feel like is taken in a way where we're like oh you know like we solved it together instead of me on my own solving it um and then also there there will be times where there'll be a back and forth and oftentimes it just takes space and time for them to come around or you end up compromising. Um, but at the end of the day, you are helping facilitate their vision. And there should never be anger in the presentation of an idea of you being like, well, this is how it has to be. Um, because then that's when walls are built up and animosity starts. But taking the fact that it's a collaboration and you're in it together, you know, they oftentimes will come to your side or it'll be something that they feel strongly about and you'll just have to be like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll do it your way. Um, but most of the times I win. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> right. I wish we could all win, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're so welcome. Sophie, you're up next. Hi, Joy. Lovely to meet you. Um, I was just... Um, I was just going back uh, thinking about the sound and the dialogue, like in Beale Street when Trish announces her pregnancy, but she doesn't really have to because you cut to black. Like, what's the kind of decision around that? Because I feel like that's quite innovative and there's like, like Dee Allen used to do that type of stuff where she would just cut randomly during a sentence. Like, what's your approach to dialogue? Um, you know, it's, it's a relationship that I feel like Barry has always liked to play around with dialogue and information that the audience has or doesn't have yet. Um, we did it in Moonlight where, you know, we did slow motion, but the dialogue was, you know, at 24 and it was one of the, it's, it's a tricky thing to do um, to make it feel intentional and not like gimmick. Um, and I feel like, doing, you know, playing like little editing tricks and stuff like that with the audience, it, it kind of, it, well, it doesn't kind of, it changes the experience and how you take in the information, um, slowing the picture down, but keeping the audio the same. It makes you feel sometimes disoriented or it makes you pay attention to what's being said even more because now you're like, okay, the picture and the audio is not matching. So my 
now my hearing is even more heightened. And so I'm paying attention, kind of leaning in to being like, why is the information being given to me in this way? Um, and so it's, it's something that we like to play around with. Um, but we also like to do it when it feels intentional. Same for like the close-ups where they're looking directly into the camera. Um, we don't want to do it just because it looks cool. We want to do it because there's an emotion and there's an element of this character's journey that we want you to feel in a way where it's kind of like a, you know, a punch to the gut and it feels authentic. Um, and so oftentimes when we're doing, you know, things like that, it's around an important moment or you as an audience member feel so engaged with the character that when we do just cut to black, you're like, oh, you know? <laughs> um, and so I think that's overall um, what we're trying to convey when we do moments like that. Yeah, completely man manipulating the audience, perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, um, I was also wondering, like, how would you climb as an assist, like, to start an assembly cutting, like, for instance, like, what's the next step that you would have recommended, like, to yourself looking back in your early 20s? Um, wow. So much. <laughs> um, I so are you, are you saying like what like information I would give my myself about like the journey or uh, just really like how to go from an assist to mm -hmm. like the assist or to the assembly cutter or getting onto online or yeah, I would say the thing that has proven tried and true throughout all of my career our contacts matter. Um, the way I got out of reality and in, in, into scripted TV was through an editor that I worked with on one of the reality television programs. And she had left to work in scripted television. And um, she reached out to me. She's like, I just, she's like, you work so hard. And I remember that you were so passionate about getting into scripted. Um, I have a friend who's looking for an assistant. Are you interested? And it was a really hard, you know, call to make because I was offered an opportunity to start editing in reality. Um, and then a lot of times you feel like editing is the goal. Um, but what I've come to realize is editing is not the goal. It's great to edit. It's really, you know, like it's, it's so cool. I love the opportunity, but what really should matter is enjoying the experience. Um, I know a lot of editors who aren't happy because the job they're on is grueling. The hours are really hard. They're not really passionate about their projects, um, but you know they have to earn a paycheck. I, on the other hand, even though it took me longer to get where I'm at, I love what I do. I love that I get to collaborate with some of my best friends. Um, and the journey to get there was hard, you know? I just kept feeling like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Like, I feel like I'm prepared, but people aren't hiring me. Um, and it's not necessarily you're doing something wrong. It's just that sometimes the projects you're going after are not going to be a good fit. Um, and I think the thing that I would tell myself is you can't be so consumed by getting into the chair, like enjoy the journey to the chair. Cause once you are in the chair, it's a lot of work. And it's a lot of pressure, <laughs> you know, like I think back, like my friends are like, oh my gosh, you used to have so much more, you know, so many parties, you know, years ago. And I was like, oh, cause I was an assistant and, you know, I left it all in the cutting room once I left the door, you know, once I, I walked out of the office, but now the job stays with me, um, which is, you know, I love, but it is, it's a lot, it's a lot more pressure and a lot more consuming. Um, once you get to the chair. So I would say the one thing I would really, really emphasize is enjoy the journey because the experience getting there, to me, you learn so much and you make so many good friends through it. Like the war stories that people have from cutting rooms, you know, it bonds you. Um, and I think at the end of the day, I wouldn't change, you know, the journey that I went on to get here at all because I learned a lot. I really did. And I made some wonderful, wonderful friends. That's awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Ingrid, you're up next. 
Okay, cool. Uh, can you hear me? I think my internet is a bit funny. I get all our internet. <laughs> yeah. <a bit> funny. <laughs> okay, so Joy, first, it's really nice to hear your voice. It's like being, I don't know, in a boat, just being carried on. So thank you. Um, I actually want to ask, and I hope it's clear enough, my question, about the importance of your, where you got, you know, being a woman, and a black woman and in in the US and like how do you see how you know the importance of what you're doing right now to not only the film industry but for society really and it because I was reading your interview for Shondaland and then um, I think on the headline was saying um, the art as a protest and I want to ask you how much you include that in your work as well and how you see the editing as a protest as well, or if there is any connection to that too. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And yes, definitely. I think one of the things that I guess people say, like uh, once they know me, they understand it, is that I, I don't understand limitations. Like people would tell me like, well, that's not how it's done. I'm like, why not? <laughs> They're like, well, you can't. I'm like, why can't I? <laughs> and so um, getting into editing, I saw the editor at Universal Studios and like, oh, I want to do that. Um, and I didn't think like, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm going to you know, try to get into this world where um, there's a limited amount of people of color. There's a limited amount of females. I just saw something and was like, I want to do that, too. Um, and it wasn't until we were um like the possibility of being nominated for moonlight and um I remember my friend was like oh my gosh like if you get nominated would you be the first black female I'm like oh, no I don't think so <laughs> and then they came back and they're like no you will be and I was like I can't be true like there's been others and then I realized oh there hasn't been others and the significance of that kind of hit me like oh well I just assumed that I was going somewhere that's, you know, and someone else has gone before. Um, but to realize that um, that wasn't the case was kind of like, uh, I felt the weight of the responsibility to, um, to hold the door open behind me. And so because of that, I, you know, there's a group of female, um, Black female film editors that I mentor. And one of the things that I am so um, aware of is getting them into these opportunities that oftentimes were not considered. Um, because, you know, being a person of color, they always think of you when they're doing a movie of color, but when, you know, saying they're, say they're doing like Ninja Turtles or, you know, <laughs> or if they're doing like a really cool action movie, they wouldn't think of like, oh, I would be cool to have a black female assistant editor. Um, and that's one of the, the stigmatisms I'm trying to break. Like we can be a part of a cutting room, no matter what type of movie you're working on. We should be a part of the industry, you know, as a whole, not in this like very significant box of like, we check the box of being a black and a female and oh my, look, we have diversity on a diverse film. You know, it's kind of like, we need to shake things up in a way where everyone's included all the time, not in these like certain circumstances. Um, and that's one of the things that I really try to be aware of. Like I had a, um, one, of the, um, one of the girls I've mentored got onto a Marvel movie. And I thought that was fantastic because to me, I was like, you're in this world that I, I can attest to sometimes the really bigger budget movies and the really big cutting rooms to find a woman or someone of colors, you know, far and few between. And I feel like we should have access to that as well. It shouldn't just be on these very specific movies that people are patting themselves on the back because they have someone of color or female on their team. Um, and so that's the thing that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say we can work in comedy space, we can do dramas, and we can also do animation, what I'm doing right now. So um, that's kind of like my, my mission is to, to pave the way that it's not rare or um, unheard of to see a Black female editor in all of these spaces. Cool. Yeah, that's really nice to hear that. 
Um, then the other thing is uh, when you're asking how much do you think you leave, you have to leave a gap for the audience to fill or you try to be, you know, as didactical as possible, assuming that they might not be, they might not fill in the gap. What's yeah. the balance in there? It's hard because it's funny because I am, um, I oftentimes like it's it I know it's smart to leave um to leave space for people to laugh but sometimes they won't laugh <laughs> and that space you know is like it feels awkward um and so I feel like I don't try to I don't try to butt jokes up like back to back I try to leave a little bit of space but also one of the things I think is cool is um someone just said this about Zola they're like I watched it a second time and laughed even harder because there were some things that they missed. And I feel like that's to me as an editor, I love, I love when people go back and watch something I've worked on again. Um, Cause that, I feel like there's so much out there. There's so much content. And the one thing as filmmakers that we're asking pe of people is something that they'll never get back and it's their time. So if you want to go back and watch something that I worked on multiple times, I feel like that's one of the greatest compliments of all mm -hmm. to say like you enjoyed the experience so much you want to go on it again. Um, and that's why I feel like don't leave too much space for the joke because sometimes people will not find it funny. But then there's others like whenever you're um, screening your film and you notice, oh my gosh, this laughter went on really long. We should leave some room for that. Um, I would always take that into account because there's a moment in Zola um, that like we had moved on to the next scene and someone was still laughing about it. <laughs> I, I would you. probably be that person. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we might need to leave a little bit more space after that one because <laughs> they were still going. Um, but I, but I, I love, like, there's nothing better than mm. hearing someone experience and enjoy something mm. you worked on. Um, it's a lot of fun, but also it's, it's very informative to know like, okay, maybe a little bit more time here, or actually, you know what, we think that's really funny, but no one's been laughing at that. So let's tighten up that space a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Cool. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah I can just pass it on there. <laughs> Thank I you so much. Well, oh, you're so welcome. Okay, Greg, over to you. Hi, Joy. Nice yeah. to meet you. Thanks very much for coming on, talk to us. Um, kind of just continuing on from you talking about leaving space and uh, and room for the audience to to come in themselves. Uh, kind of how how did you then approach that with the climax, uh, the diner scene in uh, Moonlight? Was there any kind of trepidation with the climax being an inner conflict? And uh, were you at all worried that all this kind of space that was left uh, left on the screen, that that, uh, I don't know, maybe wouldn't come across to every audience member? Yeah, you know, it feels like I was, when I was working on that scene, it felt like daily I was going to the diner because I spent so much time um trying to craft that experience so you as an audience member felt like you were with them in that diner um and it's interesting because I say as an editor one of the hardest things to do is to work on something where you're in a space for such a long time and you know I, I you know I it was funny I I did a panel on uh Dee Dee Allen and one of the, the films I spoke about was Breakfast Club because they're in that, <laughs> they're in that, you know, they're in that um, school, the whole entire movie, you know, but it's so engaging and you're so in it. And that's a testament to being invested in the characters. And so as an editor, you have to create this environment and you have to craft these performances and both actors, Trevante and Andre gave so much in that scene, um, which made my job really easy. But it's knowing when to be on the right character at the right time. And also realizing that the space that you're leaving is, is the way you're leaving that space. So the audience feels like the, the actors are processing or the characters are processing what's happening to them 
every single time they watch it. Um, and that's, it's a hard thing to do because if you rush it, it doesn't feel earned. If you leave too much space, people start to disengage. And especially nowadays with phones and iPads and laptops and, um, you know, when people are at home watching your work, um, you want them not to ever look and see where their phone is or, or be like, you know, like, what am I going to get from the grocery store? You want them to be in it with you. Um, and so I think as an editor, I'm always mindful of like hooking the audience in a way where they feel like as they're watching the scene unfold, they're dropped into that location with the characters. Um, so a lot of time back and forth being like, is this too long? Is this too short? Should we go here? Um, and it's one of the things that sometimes, like for about two weeks straight, Barry and I would be like, load up the diner, <laughs> we would go and we would watch it. Um, and to a point where um, I felt as an editor, if you ever get to a point and you start watching your work and you're in it and not thinking about what you can change, then you're done. I always say, leave it alone. Don't touch it. Like you have, you've gone from being an editor to an audience member, then you know, you've done your best. That's what the scene's supposed to be. Um, and like Barry says, don't break it. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks very much. That was very interesting. Um, and kind of the next question I want to ask is, out of all the kind of experiences you've had that have built you as an editor, has there ever been one uh, kind of, what's the one thing that stuck out that you would say is your best educator as an editor? Ooh. I would say again, time, <laughs> time, time, whether you have an abundance of it or not enough, it makes you resourceful. Um, it makes you think outside of the box. And it also makes you very, very aware of your limitations. Um, and so I know some people think like, because you only have a short amount of time, you can't get the best film out of it. Um, but I don't think that's true. I think, you know, sometimes the limitations of filmmaking enables you to produce a better product. Um, say someone had five years to cut a film, you know, at the end of the day, is that gonna be the best version of that film? I don't think so. <laughs> You've had too much time to second guess yourself um, to undo some of the brilliance that probably came from, you know, your initial pass. Um, and I just feel like when we have limitations, it, it, it causes us to really, really utilize all the elements that we've been given. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say time. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think I'll pass it on now. They're very interesting. Uh, thanks, Greg. And now, Last person, Lauren, you've got the last two questions. Perfect. Hi, Joy. I just want to say it's absolutely lovely to meet you. Um, yeah, the first question I had was, um, you were mentioning earlier about the importance of like how much you value sound and how you can actually tell the editors who um, really like ha have that as like an importance going forward in their work. And I was wondering how like quickly or how soon into the process of editing do you involve the uh, sound mixer or the the composer and all those um all those elements of it I wanted to know like I guess what your process was around working with them yeah you know I, it's one of the things I love is when you work on um projects that have a little bit more money then you can bring on sound um a lot earlier and our sound person um that we work with is Annalie Blank um, and I've known Annalie, it's so crazy. We both were coming up in the industry at the same time. And she also is, um, she's a female working in um, the sound department as a re-recording mixer, a dialogue editor. And she also mixes dialogue and music. And, she, you know, she was another one who people told you, you can't do it. And she's like, yes, I can. Um, Cause she, um, she worked, she worked on Game of Thrones. Um, she's won five Emmys uh, off of that show and um, she's now working in film, which she was trying so hard to get into. Um, but people were like, no, you're a TV mixer. And she's like, no, I can do film. And I'm so proud of her because she 
um, she knew what she wanted to do and she went after it. And I'm, it's, it's not easy when people keep on telling you as a female, you belong here, you know, cause it, it, it's one of the things that people, the bias is done sometimes, you know, people do it, not being aware of how they're treating you. Um, but when you go after what you want to do and people are like, oh, I knew it all along. And I'm like, you were one of the naysayers. How are you? <laughs> How are you now a supporter? Um, but she is one of those people where she loves sound. Like working on the Lion King right now, she went, um, she went and recorded uh <laughs> some of the animal sounds and sent back pictures. And I just love how passionate she is about getting really authentic sound. Same for an underground, she had someone go out and um record this really old train for us to use um for the train sequences in underground. And so she gets involved really early on. Um, we try to get her the script as soon as possible. We'll talk about some of the ideas or motifs that we want to um, incorporate into the film. And um, she'll send stuff back to us that we can work with, like a temp mix. Um, for instance, like the film we're working on right now, everything is done in storyboards first and then it's shot. And um, that storyboard outline of the film she did a temp mix for us and um someone was like have you guys done this before I'm like no this is our first time they're like sounds great and I was like it's Lana <laughs> um but it's also sound is so important in animation because you for the most part when you're looking at storyboards it's like 2d animation sometimes some of the stuff's not even really moving and so if you can sell the story with the sound design it really made a lot of people be like, oh, this one's going to be cool, you know? Um, and so I feel like if you can bring sound on as early as possible, it's super helpful. They also can dig out some of the dialogue that can be lost in the recordings um, and clean up a little bit of areas because everyone always says they can watch a rough cut. They can't. Like, <laughs> I always try to polish up the sound as most as I can on, on a rough cut, because oftentimes people will, their first note will be like, sound a little spotty. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, I know it's a rough cut. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as, as, as early as possible, I like to start getting sound involved. Perfect. Yeah, that's really, really good to know. And then finally, the other question I had was just, um, I was really struck by that there's a scene in If Beale Street Could Talk where Fanny and Daniel are discussing Daniel's experience in the prison system. And when I watched that, I actually had to like rewatch it back because I wasn't, I didn't actually notice like the cuts within this, the sequence. And I was like, how did she, like, how did she do that? I just want to know like, what was the, the, your, the thinking behind that scene and how many, I guess, drafts to take to get to that point with it? <laughs> Yeah, it's funny because um, I, I worked on Moonlight and if Bill Street could talk with um, my co-editor, Nat. And um, it's funny because both in Moonlight and in Beale Street, I got these really long scenes, two guys talking. And I said to Barry, my, you keep on giving me these scenes um, that are very, very tricky because when you're dialed into a moment, you don't want to ever feel taken out of it. Um, and so that was another one where I, you know, I've watched that scene so many times and really had to be conscious of, of how to get from one character to the next without breaking the atmosphere that had been created. Um, and Barry, you know, shot that scene very, him and um, James, our cinematographer, um, they shot that scene very traditional and then they took the camera and they put it on a glider, I believe is what it's called. And so basically Barry was like the, the energy on set between the two actors were, he was like, it was so intimate that he didn't wanna like put the camera on one and put the camera on another. He wanted to pass that energy from actor to actor. And so you'll see like, it starts off very traditional. And then as, they start to really reveal themselves to each other and talk about what their experience in this world has been. We transition into the footage with the glider. And so um, every cut that I made was, it was very, I was trying to be very aware not to disrupt the audience's 
um, experience, but also be sure that I'm on the right character at the right time. And it's funny that you said you went back and watched it because someone tweeted like, you know, they did this camp, they did this scene in one take. And I was like, well, they didn't. <laughs> That's a, quite a few takes in there. Um, but it was also, I was kind of honored to think that, oh, they didn't think there's any edits in that. That's, you know, that's kind of a, it's kind of a compliment to me that it was so invisible, you know, that they didn't, they didn't clock it. So um, yes, a lot of, a lot of hard work, a lot of consideration. And also I often pr process things when I'm away from the office, I'll think about like, oh, you know, there is that one take like I'll be washing dishes and I'll think about it. I'll be cooking and I think about it. Um, Cause when you're in it, you, you know, when I'm on a film, I kind of take it wherever I go. I'm always thinking about it. I'll write things down. And sometimes Barry and I will like to go get a glass of wine after work. And oftentimes when we're away from it and discussing the film, we like will hit on things that we weren't thinking about. And I'm like, oh yeah, I'll try that tomorrow. Um, and so that's why I also say, it's great to be a filmmaker, but you also need to, to take a step back from just being in the office, go for a walk, have a glass of wine, talk to your friends. And in do those activities, things will sometimes reveal themselves to you. And like that wouldn't have happened if you were staring at the computer trying to figure out a scene. So. Great stuff. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Oh, Thank no. you. That was fantastic. <laughs> Listen. I, I, I can't describe to you, Joy, literally trees are bending outside. We are in the middle. And yet it has been so fascinating to listen to you and to this conversation. You know, you've made and been involved with you know, so many of my favorite, you know, um, films and, you know, Underground Railroad is just fantastic. But I am so honored. This is a really beautiful, beautiful masterclass and the information, knowledge, pearls of wisdom that you shared with us today and I know that you know there's a, a small audience here but there's going to be as I said audiences um in in our on our two cinema screenings and online who are going to just again be able to benefit from from the wisdom of, of your your knowledge and, and your your insights so thank you so so much as I said for for giving us your time and guys great questions I, really? I thought they were <laughs> very very happy Thank you all so much. And Gian, I don't know if, I think she might have gone, but thank, thank you so much for, for, uh, for helping us to, to kind of corral, lasso Joy for, for an hour and get, as I said, all this information and knowledge. Joy, best of luck. Look after yourself. And uh, I hope we can get you to Ireland sometime soon. Oh, I would love that. Thank you so much. It was so lovely to meet each of you and fantastic questions. And I hope nothing but the best for you and your careers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all soon. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.